uh, the annexation of Danville, and I'll, I have a map that's coming up shortly that shows that. Uh, the annexation of Danville, which was the er predominantly the area from the Little Androscoggin River confluence south, uh, it was best situated to build a mill and generate those hydro facilities on the Danville side of the river. Um, so part of the move for annexation was, again, to, to create that ideal, ideal layout um, for the city. So this is a uh, 1860s view uh, of, uh, of the cities of, of Lewiston and Arbor, and I'm going to sneak through here to try to point some things out. So here's my, my reference to, to Danville. So the, the map here is Mark Danville. Uh, this is the, the main, uh, main central line, uh, Pan Am as it's known uh, today. Uh, there's a rail line uh, running from uh, where Mill 5 ultimately would show up in the landscape south. <clears throat> You'll note that there is, there is no rail line uh, coming in. There was no Lewis and Auburn Railroad Company uh, at the time. Uh, and you can see that the canal network as laid out. Uh, my next slide zooms in. And it's part of, uh, I mentioned the, the romanticizing the, the view of, uh, of, of Lewiston with Little Canada and, and, and the workforce housing. Uh, the Lewiston Canal System, there, there was a much grander master plan we can see the upper canal here, you know, Kennedy Park to orient you, Chestnut Street. Uh, the upper canal, uh, which runs by the, the uh, Androscoggin Mill, uh, there were plans for the lower canal and additional branch canals that were ultimately never built. Uh, this is the Continental here, uh, labeled Quarter Mill. Anyone who's been to the Franco-American Heritage Center on Oxford Street, that canal actually dead ends. Um, uh, and obviously there's a connection back from the hill mill. Uh, the original plan was to actually continue this canal network uh, to the south uh, with additional branch canals uh, to complete a full build out of, of Lewiston. So when they master planned Lewiston, uh, there was a lot more intense uh, textile development being planned based on the available mechanical power. Um, and unfortunately, uh, due to a number of uh, situations, both the change in the economy and competition elsewhere, um, but uh, uh, change in technology, uh, where these folks were able to uh, generate electricity. You didn't need the mechanical power, so location, location became a lot less important uh, once that had happened. And here, of course, is a view of, uh, a view of from 18, I think that's 1902. So the annexation has happened here. We can see at the bottom. So. <clears throat> Uh, New Auburn is born, if you will, um, and, and carved out in a traditional street grid. Uh, and you can see the, the end of the, the canal network. So what you see in place for the canal in 1902, that was, that was ultimately what we had. Uh, but you can still see today uh, in that yellow box closest to the river where Little Canada is today, that was a mill site. Uh, some older maps, some of the uh, 1873 sets uh, refer to them as mill sites. Uh, where LePage Bakeries uh, sits today, again, another mill site. Uh, ultimately, those sites were never uh, were never fully utilized, and were converted to other uses based on uh, available business need at the time. 1850, uh, the first section built was about an 1,100 foot section. Um, they wanted to get it started. Uh, the challenge was they were also trying to get investors from Boston to be able to build mills. They didn't want to spend all of their capital getting the canal system set up, and ultimately not have the investors coming behind. So the system itself was. Uh, was phased in over a number of periods. Uh, there are uh, good details. Uh, uh, Doug's book on, on the frontier city, the, the, uh, sort of Lewiston up into becoming a city, uh, lays out some of the change in ownership, uh, which was probably a change in name on paper. Uh, for the most part, the, the companies that ran Lewiston and Auburn, whether it was power companies or the mill companies, uh, were the same folks. They were just doing it under, uh, under different corporate names. Um, the Upper Canal uh, was finished by, by about the 1860s, uh, and it runs in length about 4,200 feet. Uh, the lower canal uh, runs about 1,600. Uh, the upper canal drops 28 feet, so it's 28 feet of head. Uh, and the head is important for you know, how much power you can generate at each of those facilities. Uh, the drop at the fall is actually 38 feet, uh, but by the construction of a granite dam uh, at the head, and you can actually get a good sense of that if you're ever up by the railroad trestle. Uh, don't trespass, but if you look, you can't really see it now, it's underwater. But typically during the summer, you can see sort of arched, arched granite, which makes its way all the way to the head of the canals. 
Uh, that was put in place to, to maximize the amount of head available. Uh, the lower canal drops uh, drops 22 feet. Um, and again, I mentioned the, this dynamic of uh, there was a delay in building the system because of the, the need to try to secure investors from away. Uh, another interesting piece, and, and I know this happened on uh, on the Merrimack, it, it was a challenge on, on the Connecticut, which is sort of the, the longest of the, and the biggest drop of the industrial rivers in New England. Uh, the city of Lewiston, or at least the, the, the taxpayers in Lewiston, got into a business arrangement in the late 1870s with the Franklin Company. Uh, mostly upstream uh, were timber, timber owners, timber producers, paper mills, uh, connecting log drives, using the river for transport of wood. Uh, Penobscot River interests actually owned the uppermost dams on the Androscoggin River that controlled uh, the flow of water. Uh, having a canal system was, was great. Uh, you could operate when there was water. The challenge is after, uh, after the spring uh, freshets, uh, come summer, you were out of luck. Uh, if you didn't have water in the canals, you weren't making power. So, so control of the entire river system uh, was critically important for uh, not only the the mill owners uh, and the, and the uh, hydro company owners, but ultimately for the residents of Lewiston who wanted to make sure the mills could operate. Uh, so with <clears throat> some willing and dealing and some uh, investment from Lewiston taxpayers, uh, the upper dams were actually acquired uh, and through subsequent uh, transfers of ownership as a package, uh, the same hydro company that owns our canal system today as well as the three major dams on the main stem of the Androscoggin still owns those upper reservoirs. Uh, and is able to manage the entire system uh, as a block. It was unique in that era that the, the municipality would actually, the taxpayers would help front some of that capital. Uh, in the case of the Merrimack, it, it was, from what I've gathered, uh, almost exclusively uh, private capital. Um, so with, with the build out of the canal system, you know, before we get into a hydroelectric, you may be wondering how much, how much power was there with the mechanical power? Um, by references in an 1869 hydropower of Maine uh, book that I actually picked up in my, my collection off from eBay, uh, Joshua Chamberlain, when he was governor, uh, commissioned a report to look at what the hydropower potential for the entire state of Maine was. So literally every, every drop of water, uh, every major river, every tributary, every lake, stream, pond was assessed for its storage capacity, uh, uh, for managing water flow, uh, and also its horsepower. Uh, to look at where there were gaps and what type of build out was going to be available so Maine could be positioned in the Industrial Revolution. A uh, real fascinating book. Uh, and it estimated Lewiston had a, about 9,000 horsepower uh, of potential uh, to start. Uh, it referenced the potential if, if water capacity was properly managed to double or triple that capacity. Um, in terms of numbers, how many mills could that power? Um, at 9,000, probably 25 to 30 textile mills of that era. We ultimately never, uh, as, you, as you look at the landscape then and, and even now, we also, obviously a lot has been torn down or burned down. Uh, never got to that full build out of 25 to 30 mills within that district, uh, but that was the potential. Uh, part of what excited uh, folks like the Littles and ultimately Benjamin Bates, uh, looking at places, especially in Maine, like Biddeford uh, and Saco or places like Lawrence, the topography really wasn't going to be ideal for a full build out. Um, you typically had fairly large ledge and fairly large uh, uh, significant topography heading down to those rivers where the falls were. Uh, Lewiston, as you look at the landscape and if you look at, a, at an aerial map, uh, is really tapered away from the river. And what that allowed them to do was really build the canal system into that taper. So you, you had a natural plain, an upper plain where the Bates, the Hill, the Androscoggin could sit and a lower plain where the Lewiston Mill, the Lowell Mill, the Continental Mill could sit. That was the natural topography of Lewiston. Uh, so that, that became a major selling point uh, as they sought investors was that this was a place where Lewiston was positioned with the amount of power and that the grade was actually going to make it a lot less expensive uh, to get mills to get mills through the ground. Power starts to transition, you've got the ability to generate electricity, then the ability to transmit. Um, so you, you move away from you know, using the, the small, uh, limited head of, uh, of the canal system to actually constructing large hydroelectric facilities. Uh, and the first major facility to get built here was Deer Rips Dam. Uh, construction started in 1902, it took about two years uh, for them to build that. Uh, major selling point was that not only was there gonna be additional power 
uh, based on what was already available in Lewis and Auburn. But for the first time, Auburn was going to have an opportunity for its industry to benefit. Um, for the most part, Lewiston had uh, sort of garnered the winnings uh, of, because of how the canal system and topography played out. Uh, Auburn did have some sawmills and grist mills, uh, but this actually created the opportunity for the shoe industry boom uh, because you, had, you were going to have power easily accessible. Um, and as part of the dynamic, uh, and as we project forward, uh, Lewis and Auburn was a place because we had transportation and we had really, really cheap power. Um, that was the, the great attraction for the shoe investors and even the textile growth still then was power was extremely cheap to be here. Um, and for residents, that this, the, the modern amenities that they were seeing people use in other cities, uh, and there's some, some great news stories, people raving about the possibility of electric irons to, to iron their clothing or electric stoves. Um, uh, something for me as sort of a, an, an urban planning junkie as well uh, was that there was so much power being produced, uh, they actually, the, uh, Libby and Dingley, who, who led the creation of the facility, and that they're, they're, they were actually named, the dam was named after them originally before it returned to Deer Rips Dam. Uh, they worked to create other companies and create customers for their power. Uh, the street system, uh, trolley system that existed in Lewis and Auburn, the bath system, the Brunswick system, were all powered by the Deer Rips Dam. Uh, and uh, small stations uh, between here and Portland were put in place to power the, the Portland, Lewis, and inner urban. Um, when you can still see the station down on Middle Street. Uh, if you travel on Hotel Road, um, uh, when you cross the Little End of Scoggin River, uh, you, not only do you see the, the St. Lawrence Atlantic, the Lewis and Auburn Railroad line, but the uh, bridge and the abutments from the inner urban still exist there. There's actually a street off of Poland Road called Inner Urban Road. Uh, there was a 60 mile an hour electric train that ran uh, for a long period of time to Portland, uh, powered by the fact that this dam uh, existed. Uh, to give you a sense of, uh, of, of some of the, the shift in, in, in horsepower, uh, I mentioned that uh, Lewis and Falls mechanical power, about 9,000 horsepower. Uh, this one facility, uh, 7 megawatts, or about 9,400 horsepower. Um, uh, there really wasn't a lot of potential around Deer Rips, which was a, a small set of falls, to do anything else. Once this facility was in place, you had the equivalent of the entire uh, mechanical system of the canal through one small, uh, one small generator. It's, uh, it's, it's easy to think about the industrial uh, history use of, uh, of the Androscoggin River sort of exclusive to what we see in Lewiston Auburn. Uh, there's, there's a real dynamic of what we don't see. Uh, some of this, if you were here the last time I, I spoke with, with you folks, uh, uh, it's the same, same story, but it's tied to this narrative as well. Uh, there are a number of villages along the river in Turner, uh, North River Road, uh, which pulls off of Center Street. Center Street didn't exist back in the day. Uh, North River Road, Farmington Road, continued along the river up through Livermore. Uh, this is a view of, of River Road uh, in Turner at a place called Conant Place, a small village on the southern end of Turner, not far over the Auburn Line. After the flood of 1896, uh, ice jams doing a, a significant amount, uh, significant amount of damage uh, in that area. Uh, but given the, uh, the the strong appetite for uh, industrial development by by Lewis and Auburn in particular, and, and a growing market elsewhere for electricity. Uh, <coughs> Central Maine Power pursued the construction of Gulf Island Dam. And while the 50-foot drop uh, from, the, from the above Lewiston Falls to the, to the river base is significant, uh, this is a 100-foot drop. That dam is a 100-foot tall dam. Uh, it, it was built really on Gulf Island. That's why they call it Gulf Island Dam. You can see the southern end of the island. Uh, the northern end, of course, is underwater. And it literally turns the river into a lake for 20 miles. Uh, challenge, of course, being I showed you a picture before, uh, there were people living and there were villages on the river in Turner. Uh, and while the Flagstaff Lake story is often cel celebrated, at least from a sort of understanding uh, the, the, the impacts of, of history and, and telling those stories, uh, very few people know the story of the residents of those villages in Turner that had to be destroyed to make way for this power facility. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you know, there, were, there were a number of villages, farmsteads in particular at, off of Center Bridge Road, uh, about halfway through Turner, uh, there was a fairly well-settled village. Churches, cemeteries, schools, small sawmills, clusters of homes, uh, all of which had to be destroyed um, for the rising water. <clears throat> Not all the foundations ultimately went underwater, uh, but Central Maine Power had acquired all of that real estate anyway. Uh, this facility uh, is a 23 megawatt facility that's over uh, 30,000 horsepower. Um, a significant facility. Uh, actually, second though, 
in the scheme of all the facilities on the main stem of the river in Lewis and Auburn. The Monte Hydro, which was built in the